Hey, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm really glad to be here today. And uh, we are having a conversation today with some industry experts about aviation supply chain. And I'm happy to introduce to you two experts in the industry. Um, I have Seema and I have Ishan. Hey, Seema, um, tell us who you are and what do you do? Hi, Mark. Great to be here. Uh, my name is Seema Full, and uh, I am an industry practitioner in the supply chain space. Uh, I've got a background in transforming supply chain for 25 plus years. I've been working with uh, consumer goods industries, high tech manufacturing and aerospace and defense. And uh, a few years ago, I started my own firm. And uh, so now I run Four Optics and we are focused on helping companies improve their supply chain performance. Great. It's, re it's really good to have you um, here to talk about this topic today because, you know, we see it all over, you know, the news and we, we hear the impact from our suppliers and what's happening in the area of supply chain. And I know that sometimes it's been used so much that it seems like, oh, no, not another discussion about supply chain. But I wanted to bring some really good experts into our discussion today so we could have really some substantive conversation about it. So that's good. So I also have Ishan um, with us. Ishan, who are you and what do you do? Thank you for having me here. Uh, uh, I am an aviation professional with more than 15 years of experience. And my experience has been diversified into airlines, MROs, and now it's a consulting firm. I, have, I was predominantly working with JT Airways and United based out of uh, San Francisco for some time. And uh, I've been working with Ramco for more than two years now into consulting domain. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So you're with Ramco Systems and it's very interesting that you have um, uh, that many years of operational experience uh, with an airline, you know, having to deal with the supply chain and the purchasing, um, you know, kind of problems and issues. So I'm, I'm really glad to have you part of our conversation today. Hey, let's, um, let's kick this off right away. And uh, I'd like to maybe direct this first question to you, Seema, and say, you know, what are the key priorities of aviation supply chain organizations today? What do you think they're really thinking about today? What are their priorities? You know, that's a great question. Um, I think there's a multitude of things happening, as we all know. Uh, I would say, you know, one of the biggest elements that comes to mind is understanding demand. There's so much uncertainty, as we've seen in the last few years. And, you know, we all had hypotheses on how it might turn out for the aviation supply chain. So I think one of the biggest priorities is understanding the risk in their supply chain, both from a demand perspective and from a supply perspective, and really having uh, an ability to model and understand what might happen if if certain situations were to change globally, geopolitical situations and flight hours and passenger sent sentiment and so on and so forth, because we're de definitely not at a place where everything is stable and hunky dory. Everybody feels great about traveling and there's no you know threat of additional pandemic issues. So all of that in the midst of all that, all of that, I think the priority is as, how do we understand risk in our supply chain and how do we plan demand? And accordingly, how do we plan our, our supply? Okay, well, th those are really good things. I got a few key things out of what you just said. You know, we're back to the old supply and demand, you know, problem again, um, which seems to hit us everywhere, all right? And we talked a little bit about risk and modeling. Um, I'm going to come back to that in a second. And before I do, I want to switch over to you, Ishan, and say, from an operations standpoint, from your experience in having been in operations, is it, how, mm -hmm. does, how does the possibility of uh, mitigating risk and being able to model the future you know, play into the success of managing a supply chain? I think what uh, supply chain or a procurement professional or a procurement organization in a in an airline would lack, lack, or in an MRO, in fact, it lacks is the, the lack of automation at this point in time. And the, the we are still the efficient professionals across the globe in, in supply chain and in procurements predominantly has been using their age old technologies or age-old methodologies to carry out their day-to-day -day businesses. Seema, you talked about, about looking at uh, supply and demand, and now how do we model that, and how do we mitigate risk and future proof problems you know, that we yeah. have? Yeah, so you know, I think there's no way to prevent risk. Um, risk is inherent in, in life in general, and specifically in the supply chain. I think what's important is to really understand what are those core leading indicators that represent risk in our immediate supply chain, and, and then be able to, um, you know, it's a real life or supply chain is a real life, life live organization organism. And so really understanding what those risks are and how are they moving? And as a result, being able to do scenario planning, as a result, come back to having robust technology solutions that allow you to have multiple scenarios that you, that you can plan to say, if this happens, what should be my, my next best alternative? Or if that happens, what's my next best alternative? Rather than simply operating 
you know, waiting until the PO shows up and it was less than what you expected or the order or the supplier order not showing up and then you got to replan your factory or replan your, your, you know, repair shop. So it's really understanding behavior of your supply chain and then being able to synchronize your actions with that behavior of the supply chain. Okay, so yeah. we're looking at factors around us that potentially could affect that and trying to uh, manage those risks uh, by, be, by being more proactive. I mean, like for example, um, supply that might be sitting in a harbor in a ship or the lack of labor, um, you know, being able to, to package and actually deliver things or trucking and logistics. We're seeing all of those problems, you know, now today. And so, so are you saying that we can, you know, begin to decouple some of those issues if we're doing better planning and uh, modeling and trying to optimize the supply chain so that any one of those variables can't collapse our supply chain? Yeah, and, and, and it's not just better modeling. It's actually, under, what the first step is understanding what are those hot spots in your supply chain, right? Not waiting until the ship is actually stuck but understanding where are we sourcing from so that as issues happen around the world, you're able to see risk coming at you, right? Now, none of us can do anything about a shipping stuff, right? That's just reality and that just happens. Um, we can't unstuck a ship, but what we can say is when we know what's on that ship and when and it's not gonna get here, we can immediately replan to the next best alternative or understanding our supply, what portion of our supply chain is in the, a risk area from a global perspective, and then being able to make, make better supply chain strategy decisions before we're stuck with an issue at our hands. So it's really keeping up with world events, keeping your supply chain up with world events. Okay. And so Ishan, um, how then does IT play into, you know, the salute, the, that, that piece of that solution then? How does having an optimized IT application play into that? Absolutely. So I'll take a cue from uh, what Seema said, and she probably said the right thing that to have a right application. It should not be just PO showing up and then you you working on it. So probably I'll cite a couple of examples what we did it did at Ramco. Uh, in fact, two hyper automations what we did at Ramco. One was one was for the procurement order or a purchase order, and another one for the was for a repair order that is subcontracting order for components, and. Let me talk first about what we did, what we achieved uh, through the hyper automation for one of our customers based out of US, who is one of the largest distributors for the parts for some of the major MRO service providers in US as well. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about AMP. Uh, uh, AMP, uh, how this automation works is like AMP receives this PO from the customer and through Aero, Ex and that too through, through Aero Exchange's EDI channel. and. And this customer PO is automatically converted to sales order and AMP's Ramco system after evaluate, automatically evaluating the customer contracts. Now, after that, the magic happens. The PO flips, this sale order flips into the PO, which is AMP's PO, looking into the, uh, the supplier contracts automatically. And then it, again, sends the PO in e, through an EDI channel, Aero Exchange's EDI channel to, the, to its supplier. And then again, through EDI, you get the shipping notification, the part is delivered at, at, at the customer location. And through electronically, we receive the goods receipt notification, goods, GR is created automatically. And on the basis of that invoice is created automatically, which is sent to the, to the customer. And when we looked upon how this process has reduced the efforts, we could see almost 20 minutes we could re reduce on each customer PO. Uh, regarding the repair or subcontracting orders generated for row tables or components, what we in aviation would you know, say, these are high value parts. And it, it, we did this, uh, we have implemented at one of our customer locations, who is the leading MRO, uh, MRO and ITM service provider based out of Hong Kong. So in this, this automation was achieved with the help of precise and extensive algorithms for rules and parameters required for the automatic generation of uh, repair orders. And through these rules and parameters, which would cover part, its type, reliability of the part, customer and supplier contracts, float values, what is the remaining life, scrap quantity, and extra. What we achieved through this automation was 80% of the repair order was processed automatically. And because of that, 90% of the customer requests were processed automatically as well. And therefore, uh, because these things were happening automatically, we saw the significant improvement in meeting SLAs and 20% direct reduction in TADs and probably three to 4% reduction in inventory carrying costs as well. Before we wrap up this segment of the question, I wanted to see what your reaction was to 
that kind of optimization of a supply chain. What, what, what can you say about that? Yeah, I completely agree with Ishan. I mean, those are fantastic results and similar to what we are seeing when we're working with our MRO clients as well. You know, reducing turnaround time is absolutely key. And, um, you know, rotables are an expensive investment. So for, you know, all parties involved. So um, to the extent that we can have dependable turnaround times, consistent turnaround times and reduce concern turnaround times, that's fantastic. You know, I was just going to mention that when we talk about risk, and when we talk about kind of what's happening in our supply chain, one of the other things that's happening today is, you know, this type of automation allows us to free up labor to do more analytical, to, you know, do more analysis of our supply chain rather than get stuck in actually doing the, you know, the, auto, the manual transactions in the supply chain. So there's another benefit of this, which is that we can really upskill the organization by allowing those folks to now focus on what happens when there is risk versus just trying to you know keep up with the manual transaction so i think that's that's fantastic